Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers. Today, we are returning to the topic of treatment for substance use disorders during pregnancy, including cases where babies are being taken by child welfare agencies because their parent was taking anti-addiction medication. Sachini Bandara and Alex McCourt, both Johns Hopkins experts in opioid policy, talk about how a tangle of policies and laws are impacting pregnant people and their families, the role of child removal in the opioid epidemic, and what needs to be done to bring a public health lens to the issue of treatment of substance use disorders during pregnancy. You can find a link to our previous episode on this topic in the show notes. Let's listen. Sachini Vandara and Alex McCourt, thank you so much for joining us. You both study how public health policies can improve the well-being of people who use drugs. And today we're going to talk about a situation where maybe the laws haven't quite caught up to some of these policies. Um, And that situation is that pregnant people who decide with their doctors to start taking anti-addiction medication for opioid use disorder are sometimes at risk for having their babies taken by child welfare agencies. So first, let's talk a little bit about why a pregnant person might decide to use this medication. And for this question, I'm going to go to you first, Sachini. I think very simply put, methadone and buprenorphine are highly effective treatments for opioid addiction. They're recommended by all the major clinical organizations for the treatment for pregnant people when they have opioid use disorder, and that includes the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and all the major addiction medicine associations. We have a deep breadth of clinical data to show that methadone and buprenorphine are associated with improved outcomes related to opioid use disorder, like reduced use of illicit drugs, reduced likelihood of overdose, improved recovery outcomes. And we also see that these medications are associated with better birth outcomes, so less likelihood of prenatal birth um, and better outcomes for baby. So I think simply put, they're they're highly effective and, and recommended. So they're effective and recommended, healthier mom, healthier baby. So what's happening then in these instances where, you know, a mother's taking this medication and then they go to the hospital to give birth? And Alex, I'm going to go to you for this. Thanks. So, yeah, we're seeing a lot of triggering of the child abuse and child welfare systems when this happens. Um, <clears throat> some of this is, is tied up in federal, state and local policy. So federal policy, there's a, creates an infrastructure. So there's the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. And that gives states funding and it gives them some guidelines for how to structure their um, child abuse and neglect systems and child welfare systems. As part of this law, states are required to notify or providers are required to notify the state if uh, a substance exposed newborn um, is delivered. And this usually triggers a plan of safe care, which is intended to to keep um, to provide treatment to the newborn and and to the family member. But as it's been amended over time, there have been some changes that have given states a lot of flexibility in in how they implement this. Um, for example, in 2016, CAPTA or the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act was amended so that it didn't just apply to illegal substances, but just substances in general. So if a a baby was born affected by substance use or withdrawal symptoms, then it required notification. In theory, this notification is separate from a report of child abuse or neglect. So because doctors are mandatory reporters, they are required to report when they have a reasonable suspicion that abuse or neglect has taken place. Federal law tried to distinguish these notifications from child abuse and neglect. They said there's, this is not a federal definition of child abuse. Um, we just want the state to keep track of these babies and their parents and make sure they're getting the services they need. In practice, that's not what is happening. States are 
um, using the same mechanisms for child abuse and neglect reporting and also for these notifications of substance exposed newborns. So we have roughly half of states that um, have laws that classify prenatal drug use as child abuse or neglect. And because of the ways that federal law has changed, sometimes uh, parents that are taking um, buprenorphine or methadone are being caught up in that. I just want to clarify something here really quickly. So, uh, and Sachini, maybe you can speak to this. Um, a, a person that is pregnant and that is taking one of these anti-addiction medications, um, they come to the hospital to have their baby. How would we know that um, that person has been taking this medication? So we see oftentimes that pregnant people are are screened for drug use at, during delivery. So they're taking a, a blood test or a urine test that screens um for use of drugs during that time. We also see that newborns are often tested for drugs in their system. So we might see that a a pregnant person and um, baby might test positive for these um, substances. We also could see that the baby might um, be exhibiting signs of withdrawal. I think it's really important to note here that uh, withdrawal alone is not necessarily an indication that the pregnant person was doing something wrong or something bad is happening. Kind of this um, neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome can encompass a wide range of outcomes and symptoms. And from a clinical perspective, often we see the recommendation is that it's preferred that a pregnant person receive these treatments during their pregnancy even if it means that baby might exhibit symptoms of withdrawal at birth, because it still prevents much riskier outcomes for both pregnant person and baby. And again, usually this is a a risk benefit conversation between the pregnant person and their healthcare provider. Okay. So they've had this conversation, they're taking the medication, they go in to deliver and uh, something pops up on a toxicology screen, or perhaps the baby is exhibiting some signs of this. And then we have these laws that Alex was talking about that kind of can get triggered. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, okay, so you were saying that usually they are meant to protect these people. Um, At what point did the role of child removal become some sort of default response? Like where, where did that start happening? A lot of this is tied up in um, kind of the war on drugs and some, some stigma associated with both drug use and also with receiving treatment for drug use. There are still a lot of policymakers and even providers that, um, have that carry some stigma um, for people who use drugs and people who are um, receiving treatment. And so there's um, ever since we started really tracking uh, these newborns and these babies that were born with symptoms of uh, withdrawal or with exposure to different substances, there's been an effort to try to involve the child welfare system. One big problem with that is that we see adverse health outcomes associated with some of these reports that life can be much more difficult for these kids and for their parents. And those burdens are not distributed equally. So uh, black and brown populations are much more likely to suffer adverse health consequences and much more likely to have their parental rights terminated. So to have families split up. And so that's a really important piece of all of this. And when you're saying, just to clarify, when you're saying adverse health outcomes, you're talking about once you get um, you know, child welfare involved and there's a removal, that can be far more damaging um, to, to families and their children. Is that, is that where? Yeah, absolutely. It can be harder to get the care and treatment that you need. There are adverse consequences for not um, associated with not keeping the family together where possible. Um, yeah, there can be, there can be uh, fairly significant adverse outcomes. And so this has this roots in, you know, the, like you said, the war on drugs. Um, but since then, you know, the the opioid epidemic and, um, you know, there were a number of laws that were enacted around that. How has this further complicated um, the issue of child welfare? And for this, Sachini, do you want to speak to that? Sure. So I think in general, we've seen just a 
large increase in the number of cases and reports related to parental drug use to the child welfare system. We've seen a huge increase in the number of child removals due to parental substance use. It's um, a crisis that is um, overburdening an already stretched system. <laughs> Um, and it's a system also, like Alex said, that is one that is very punitive in orientation and has um, really exacerbates and reflects kind of racial and, and ethnic disparities in our country. I think we've seen in addition to CAPTA, which um, Alex mentioned, we've seen some efforts in the child welfare system to try to better address um, substance use and the effect that it's had on their system. And one of those laws is the Family First Prevention Services Act, which was a federal legislation passed in 2018. Here with this law, one of the things that happened was that it allowed some more flexibility for states to use federal funds to support services that would prevent child removal, including substance use related services. I think one thing we see in the implementation here is again, this mismatch between what we know works in a clinical setting and what we know in health and public health that is effective and what is actually being done in the child welfare system. So I think a really great example of this is uh, in the Family First Prevention Services Act, methadone and buprenorphine are not recommended as very promising services that should be funded by states with this new flexible use of federal funds. Um, even though on the health side, we have decades of data showing that methadone and buprenorphine are highly effective treatments. So I think one, another issue that's coming into play here is that there is this mismatch between how we think of substance use and substance use disorder treatment in the child welfare system and then on the healthcare side. So we have a scenario where lawmakers are trying to protect babies and children from the opioid crisis, um, but it's really inadvertently impacting pregnant people and their families um, who are trying to overcome their substance use disorder. Um, so, so where do we go from here? What, what you know, you said that there's a mismatch between the clinical and and kind of what's happening in the real world. So, Sachini, where, what do you think can be done? You know, I think in the very short term, we need better definitions of plans of safe care, of what infants should be reported and what exemptions should be made. So, for example, I think federal and state regulation and legislation could clearly state that using methadone and buprenorphine are not grounds for child abuse and neglect. They're not um, grounds for kind of the initiation of a child welfare report. <laughs> I think on a larger scale, from a research perspective, we need to know better what happens when people are reported to the child welfare system, what is happening to these families and these infants, what are their outcomes. We don't have very good data on who exactly is getting reported and what their outcomes are. And then I think even more broadly, like we really need to revisit this idea of using the child welfare system as our kind of primary response to prenatal substance use um, and really thinking about how we better include public health and healthcare in that conversation and how we also better fund a system of maternal and child health services and substance use disorder treatment services that are more connected and actually resourced to provide the treatment and services that these families need. And there's a lot of stigma involved here. Alex, talk to us about the role of stigma. There's stigma really at, at all levels of this. We have policymakers that are stigmatizing um, both people who use drugs and also pregnant people and, and, and you know, reducing the autonomy of, of people who are pregnant and can become pregnant. Um, we have stigma at the, you know, health system and healthcare provider level where you know, patients that come in that have maybe a history of, of drug use or are taking some of these um, evidence-based medications for treatment are, are stigmatized and are seen as you know, somebody we, we better keep an eye on and, and do some extra testing and maybe involve um, the state child welfare system in, in their care. And then we even see that effect of stigma in you know, families and individuals, we see people not wanting to seek care or not being able to seek care because they don't have the resources um, at the individual family and community levels. And so that stigma is really 
prevalent and invasive. And I think um, it, having a public health orientation to this, as, as Sajini said, is really, really key to trying to overcome that. Well, I appreciate, uh, you know, first of all, both of you for the work that you do in trying to to get research behind this and trying to articulate these issues um, and for bringing sense to, to the headlines. So thank you both so much for being on Public Health on Call. Thank you. Thank you. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Philip Porter, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Fernandez and Shian Briscoe. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.